Hello everyone, Professor Philip Travis here. This week, we're going to look at the early republic here in American history, part one. We're going to be looking at the period of time really from the presidency of Thomas Jefferson through the War of 1812 and to the so-called era of good feelings during the period of time of President James Monroe. Uh, in that period of time, the presidency of James Monroe uh, that period of time, uh, which which begins after the end of the War of 1812, it's associated with, obviously, uh, the president for Virginia, James Monroe. It's known as the era of good feelings because it's a period of time in American history where there was only one major political party, um, and that was the Democrats, what you would today call the Democrats. It's the Jeffersonian Democratic Republicans, as they were formerly known at the time. In the War of 1812, the Federalist Party uh, really collapsed. Um, the Federalist Party had, in the, in the northern areas of the United States, uh, the shipping territories of places like uh, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts, in New England. Um, the Federalist Party ha was opposed to the U.S. entry into the War of 1812, whereas Democratic Republicans, who were uh, really the embodiment of the more agrarian elements of the United States expanding west and promoting sort of a more agrarian sort of uh, uh, of attitude the United States was much more in favor of um, of going to war with Great Britain in 1812 uh, seeing the war in some cases for some so-called war hawks as they were known at the time uh, war was seen as a potential opportunity to um, expand the power of the United States into other um, realms of North America. So we're looking at the early Republic and the early Republic, a very significant period of time. This is a period of time when the United States, for example, in the first decade of the 1800s, uh, during the presidency of Thomas Jefferson from Virginia, and then of course, James Madison, who we know of course from class, uh, known as the father of the American Bill of Rights, <clears throat> The country at that time, it's not a, it's by no means is it a world power. Uh, it doesn't have a large navy to speak of. Its armed forces are very, are very minimal indeed. Um, and uh, Thomas Jefferson's outlook, by the way, on uh, federal power in the United States too, he believed in a more limited approach as well. But the big players in the world at the time were countries like France um, and Great Britain, who were the sort of preeminent sort of global powers at the time. And of course, during uh, the beginning of the 1800s, this is the period of Napoleon Bonaparte, who had, of course, conquered and controlled um, pretty much all of Western Europe uh, until he is defeated, uh, first suffering defeat in Russia, uh, leading to his exile to the island of Elba, and then his final defeat, of course, in the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. So during this period of time when the Napoleonic Wars are happening, um, Britain and France were fighting. Uh, there's a naval war going on in addition to um, um, the issues on the continent of Europe. And that sort of drew the United States into involvement um, with Britain and France over issues surrounding um, abuses on the high seas, the impressment of American sailors and so forth. And the British were also... Um, involved in supporting uh, Native American groups, uh, particularly the Shawnee Confederation, who sought to oppose the Western uh, movement of the United States as well. But uh, the, Fr the French and the British sort of dispute uh, becomes a really important factor uh, during the first decade of the 1800s, and uh, the policies of Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, um, as well as the actions of the British, lead ultimately to the War of 1812. And, and the War of 1812 is, the War of 1812 is, is, is almost like, sometimes remembered as almost like a second independence, a second American Revolution almost, because the United States fought this war with Britain. With Britain and while um, in some respects you might argue that the war was really more of a stalemate than one side winning or, 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 or the other, uh, but nonetheless... Britain did not succeed in destroying uh, the, young, uh, the young republic. And coming out of the War of 1812, there are many iconic and symbolic sort of uh, national 
um, Im imagery that emerges, the imagery of Andrew Jackson, of course, the victor of the famous Battle of New Orleans, Francis Scott Key and his writing of the Star Spangled Banner um, during the siege of Fort McHenry um, are just a couple of examples of the sort of um, um, symbolism of the new uh, nation that come out of uh, the War of 1812. So that's what we're going to be reading about this week. I have a lecture as well this week. And this week, your primary assignment, there's no greater discussion this week. You, instead, your primary assignment is uh, a quiz. Uh, it's an 11-question quiz on my lecture video. So you need to watch my lecture video. It's about 25 minutes long. And then you need to take the quiz on that video. And I've drawn the questions directly from that video. Um, so they're designed for you to really have to watch the video to be able to get these questions correct. Um, the, the, qu the quiz has a 30 minute time limit and um, uh, it has a 30 minute time limit and it's exclusively drawn from uh, the video lecture. So let me know if you have any questions. Uh, just send me an email um, and let me know if you have any questions. But that's our primary assignment this week. Our reading as usual of course um, don't forget, post the extra credit factoid in the extra credit discussion board. I'm going to announce that in just a second. And then watch my lecture this week and take uh, the lecture quiz this week. So this is the factoid. Of course, what you're looking at here is a depiction of the Louisiana Purchase. And um, the Louisiana Purchase was made during the presidency of Thomas Jefferson it was sold to the United States by Napoleon of France, uh, largely because of Napoleon's aspirations um, on the continent of Europe, as well as other circumstances that uh, encouraged Napoleon to sell uh, this huge French territory uh, to the United States at a very, very good price, uh, no less. Um, this also helped to, to um, effectively secure the Haitian um, revolution and the independence of the people of Haiti, who had um, successfully fought for independence against the French. And um, Napoleon, who was focused more on the continental situation in Europe, uh, conquering Western Europe, that was his focus, did not really have the, the will, desire, or ability, because the British were really the dominant force in the high seas, to go back and attempt to recolonize Haiti. And so as a result of that, without a Caribbean sort of presence, um, it didn't really make much sense for Napoleon to hold on to uh, Louisiana. Here's the factoid. Thomas Jefferson, while he was president, he faced a, a number of sort of uh, difficult decisions, and one of them was the purchase of Louisiana. Jefferson actually didn't believe the president had the right or the, the constitutional power to purchase Louisiana. He actually preferred Congress to do it. And that was an example of one of the sort of um, issues that faced Jefferson. Um, another thing you put, I would like to see put in the factoid is not only the, of course, the Louisiana Purchase, purchased under the presidency of Thomas Jefferson, and of course explored and surveyed by Lewis and Clark. The other thing I would like to add there is a little factoid that's very interesting. Today in the United States, of course, the State of the Union Address is like this huge thing, right? It's all over the television uh, every year, the president giving the State of the Union speech. Thomas Jefferson never gave a State of the Union speech. He wasn't really a big public speaker, and uh, he was very much an intellectual, of course, but he wasn't a big public speaker. And so as a result of that, Jefferson actually never physically gave a State of the Union address. Instead, Jefferson wrote the State of the Union out. He hand wrote the State of the Union and then delivered it to Congress to be read uh, in Congress. So Thomas Jefferson never gave uh, a direct State of the Union speech. All right, let's have a great week. Video lecture and video quiz this week. Let me know if you have any questions.